Dummy variables actually addresses the next assignment. I just want to show you where we are before I actually explain it. That'll be assignment number five. Now, you'll probably be writing this one over the next weekend. So not this weekend, but next Saturday and Sunday, you'll be writing this one up. So dummy variables are actually something that you probably want to you're probably going to want to include in your actual final paper. They're really useful. You know how it's always good to do things for yourself rather than to have somebody do something for you? Well, it applies in statistics as well. Remember when I told you the data matrix last week? Sort of looks like this. You have actually make them X's x1, x2, x3, and it goes up to however many independent variables you have, 20 variables or whatever, okay? And you have your independent variables here, and your observations are here. And this is your first observation, second, third, fourth, da, 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 and so let's say you get 600 people in that particular panel that you're using, okay? Well, your actual right-hand side, the data matrix, is actually got not just the columns of numbers for all of the people, so that this person, Joe, has this value for the first variable, and this value for the second variable, and this value for the third variable, and Susie has that value, that value, that value. So you have numbers here, and numbers here, here, correlating, you know, uh, and um, that are uh, associated with these particular people, and it goes on for each person all the way down. But without your knowing about it, with, and this is true of SAS, SPSS, STATA, all of them, without your knowing about it and without even asking your permission, somebody came along and said, that person's gonna need an intercept. I'm gonna give them an intercept. And so, they created, they inserted a variable with the numbers one in it. And I'm gonna make sure you see that these are numbers, it's the fifth person, and this is, it's a column of ones, and they called this variable the intercept. Now, the reason is they use matrix algebra to actually solve these linear systems of equations and they only calculate slopes. So they've got to calculate a slope. Now in your next course in statistics you will actually derive using matrix algebra the solution forms because I have to use calculus to do that. It's a very simple der derivation. You're, uh, you're optimizing the sums of squared errors and it's very simple to do that, but you're, you're, you're actually minimizing the sums of squared errors, and so and you're maximizing the fit. <coughs> fit, of course, is your R square that we're talking about. And so what's actually happening here is uh, you use matrix algebra to do that with calculus, but with your intercept term, you don't treat it any differently than any of the other variables, but if you have another, <coughs> if you have a column of ones here, write down, actually I have one, two, three, four, five, I should have actually put another one in here. Well, you get the idea, there's a one for every person. Okay, and so there's a column of ones here for every person in the survey, and this one is the data times the slope, which actually is the intercept. One times anything is just that thing. So that's how they get the intercept. They have a column of ones that they don't even tell you about. One times that, so when you actually have your y equals beta naught plus beta one x one plus beta two x two plus beta three x three plus 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 all the different variables plus your epsilon, your error term. This guy right here, the intercept, is actually 
times another variable that doesn't vary <laughs> to number one. And the program never told you about it. Didn't ask you permission to do it. It just did it for you because it assumed that you needed an intercept. So that's how it got. That's algebraically how it got that intercept by putting another column of ones here. Now, what we're going to do is to say, well, I don't want it to do that for me. I want to do it. And I want to do it in a creative way. Meaning, I have a regression here. Everyone look at this plot. Don't look at your computers for this one. Everyone look at this graph. Actually, I want to make sure you in the corner can see it. So what I'm going to do is write it a little bit over here into this <laughs> spot here. Okay? You see this? You have a data cloud somewhere in here. And with, with dummy variables, you're talking about the idea that you're going to have a slope and an intercept for one group of people, or if you're using countries, for one group of countries. And you're going to have another slope and an intercept for another group of people. This may be for men, and that may be for women. This may be for Caucasians, and this may be for African Americans. Do you get the idea? This may be for Protestants, and this may be for Catholics. You're going to have, you're going to say this relationship between X and Y is a conditional relationship that depends on which group you're talking about. In which case, what's the problem with having your statistical program put in the intercept? It's going to put in an intercept and it's only going to give you one and you don't want one, you want two. And it's possible, under certain conditions, to get three. And I wouldn't advise it, but it's possible to get four. <laughs> two or three is the best. Probably two is the best. So you say, well, okay, it did that, but I don't want that. I want this. I want two separate intercepts. Now, dummy variables is normally associated with the creation of separate intercepts. However, so when people talk about dummy variables, they're talking about the creation of separate intercepts. However, the concept of dummy variables can also be used with regard to the slopes. You can have a slope for one group and a slope for the other. So you have intercept dummy variables and you have slope dummy variables. Now, in some realms of statistics, they talk about this using other words, such as analysis of variance, ANOVA, and stuff like that. And so, that's what we talk about here in the text when we get to chapter 12. So this is the only time in the course where I'm going to do this with the text. Put it aside. I'm not going to approach it the way they approach it. I'm going to approach it differently. So this entire concept of dummy variables we're not going to use the ANOVA vocabulary for using it. We're going to use the dummy variable vocabulary for using it. In addition, we're going to calculate our dummy variables differently than they talk about it in the text. And it's also going to be differently than you're probably going to be exposed to it when you have your next course in statistics. So I want to make sure you're listening very carefully why I'm calculating them differently. In the old days, They had SPSS, and then the other programs came afterwards, SAS, STATA, stuff like that. But in the old SPSS days, they didn't have a way to stop the computer from doing that, from putting this column of ones in. Does everyone hear? They did not have a way to stop it, meaning, the program was going to put that column of ones in no matter what. Now, remember the issue with multicollinearity that I brought up? We haven't covered multicollinearity formally. We're going to do that later. But I brought it up in a very beginning way by saying that the variable education and income 
is a linear combination of the other variable called status in the data set. So if you put ed education, income, and status in the equation, the whole thing blows up. Remember I showed you that last time? Well, look at what's happening. If you have the computer program putting in a column of ones, you can't have your own dummy variables the way you might, might want to write them conceptually. You can't do the following. If I want two intercepts, and I'm going to say, in this case, male, female. Hey, there's supposed to be a gender gap in American politics. Men are supposed to more, more predominantly vote Republican than women, and women are supposed to vote more predominantly Democratic than men. So there's supposed to be a gender gap. So I'm going to go here. M, F. Now, how did this, the computer program come up with an intercept? It just put in a column of ones. Hey, I can do that too. I'll put in a column of ones. Now, just to make it easy, uh, let's just go alternating. So the first person here is a Joe, and then a Susie, and then a Sam, and then a Betty, and it goes on like that, okay? Male, female, and male, female, just to make it simple. Well, I'm gonna do the same thing. Every time I have a man, I'm gonna put a one, and for the female variable, I'm gonna put a zero. And every time I have a woman, I'm going to put a zero for the male category and a one for the women. Hey, this is going great. Watch this. And this is for Sam, a one and a zero. And for Betty, a zero and a one. And it goes on all the way down here. And who's this going to be? This will be uh, Mustafa. And he will be a one zero. Okay? Now watch. I got this original intercept by having a column of ones, and then in the linear algebra, it produced an equation that was actually this one column of ones times this thing called an intercept, which is actually a slope, but since it's just times one, it just turns out to be an intercept, because one times anything is just the thing itself. So what am I gonna have here? I'm gonna have a new equation, y equals beta naught plus beta naught I'm going to go beta m. Beta m plus beta f plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 plus beta 3 x3 and so on. These are my slopes, but look what I have here. Now I have an intercept for men and an intercept for women. And I did it using the same trick of just putting in ones, but I put the ones in where I wanted instead of just everywhere. Isn't that cool? Because now this thing, this beta m, will be the actual, it'll be like a slope in the sense that it's going to be multiplied by the ones for this m category. And so this will appear only when there's a one in the m variable. So it's going to be an intercept that'll only happen for the men. And for a woman, it'll be a zero. So this thing will go away because zero times anything just goes away. And this one will be an actual intercept that will be added for the women because they'll have a 1 for the B sub F, but it'll be 0 for the men, so it won't be added for the men. So this will be an intercept for the men and an intercept for the women. Perfect, I've done it. And I've created my own intercepts. And then you run it, and it doesn't work. It bonks out. Why does it bonk out? Because this one here that you didn't ask for, that R put in all by itself, it was taking care of you, assuming that it knew better, is actually a linear combination of these two. So if you add the, the beta for this intercept for men and the intercept for women, you come up with a column of ones. And that's exactly what this was. This is exactly what happened over here. You got a column of ones. <laughs> And R is going to be able to is going to say, "Come on, give me a break here. How am I supposed to know the difference between these two guys and this guy? There is no difference. So it's not going to work. So what you have to do is to tell R 
to not use one of these guys. One of them has to be different, has to be out of there. Now here, I'm going to tell you what I do differently, and I'm going to tell you what almost everybody else does. Actually, in economics, they do mostly what I do. But in the social sciences of political science and sociology, they use a different method, which I think is just stupid. But you'll see it all over the place, and you will see faculty members in your next course in statistics teaching you this method. It's just stupid, but it's the way it's done. And it also is a way that is taught in texts. If I had to write a baby statistics book, I would probably end up teaching it that way as well, because that's what they're expecting. But it is stupid. What actually happens is the following. How this concept of dummy variables is taught is to say, get rid of one of these categories. So get rid of this one. That way the statistics program will know the difference between the B sub M and the one that the program put in automatically. But then you have to use a paper and a pencil to figure out what the, what the, what the woman was. And your t-tests don't actually test uh, what, they're, what you think they're testing. They're actually testing the difference between things. It gets complicated. <clears throat> Why did this approach happen? Because back in the 1970s with SPSS, it didn't give you an option for getting rid of this intercept that the program put in by itself without asking for your permission. It did it and you were stuck with it no matter what. So methods came about for how to make dummy variables work given the fact that this intercept wasn't going to go away. Folks, that is decades old. I mean, you can't even find manuals that reference that anymore. That is so old. That doesn't happen anymore. Now it's simple. If you want to put in your own dummy variables, simply stop the computer from putting in its automatic one. The idea of not stopping it isn't an issue anymore. It's been gone for 20 years. Yet they're still teaching that method of getting rid of one of these other categories in order to allow that one in. The better approach is to stop the computer from doing the automatic one so you have just your own. And then the t-tests will be as you normally expect them. They're different from zero. And there's straightforward tests that you can go for the difference between these two. So I'm going to explain how to do that. But I wanted everybody to clearly understand before this lesson is over the approach that you are going to learn. I consider this the modern approach. If you take a course in econometrics in an economics program, you're probably going to get exactly what I'm going to teach you. But if you go into the social sciences, sociology, political science, anthropology, whatever, and you take an advanced stat course in, in, in graduate school, they're probably going to teach you the older method. Okay? If you get that older method, just do it, learn it, smile, be done with it. But understand it's the only reason it exists is because of SPSS back in the 1970s, before you were even born. Otherwise, it shouldn't even be there. <laughs> okay? Now these are called, officially they're technically called dummy variables and it's, it's statistically exactly the same as what they call ANOVA which is covered in our book but we don't want to go there. If you hear the terms ANOVA you're probably working in a psychology department or sometimes a sociology department. If you're dealing with dummy variables you're working in a political science department or economics department. We just don't use the, the ANOVA vocabulary. We use a dummy variable, dummy variable vocabulary, uh, which is sort of standard. That's, that's, that's what they use with, uh, in the field of econometrics, which is, which is a, a applied regression. So we're going to have two intercept variables that we're going to be putting in ourselves, but these are intercept dummy variables. We also want to have the idea of not just having two intercepts, but having two slopes. So if we have X and we have Y, we may, all ha we may have a male and we may have a female, different intercepts, but different slopes as well. So if what we have here, we don't have anything separating the males and the females. So let's just look at the X1 variable. X1 variable is an interesting variable, but let's call that our X variable that we have here. We don't want just a single slope. We want a slope for men and a slope for women. How are we going to do that? So what we want to do now is to break this apart. Now this is going to be very easy. We're going to have a plus beta 1 for men 
X1 men plus beta 1 for women, but enough for females, X1 females. We want a slope for women and we want a slope for men. Now, you're going to see a problem here. If this is just for men and this is just for women, if you add the women and the men together, you're going to get the original variable here. So we want to similarly not include the regular variable. We want two separate variables, but we want x1 only for women and only for men. So let's get rid of these two other variables that we have here and let's talk about how to break um, x1 up. So instead of their x1 variable just being whatever it may be, we're going to have x1 for men and x1 for women. And so what's going to happen here is every time, let's make this a nicer m here, okay? Every time you have a value here, I'm going to put numbers in here. 3, 4, 5, 2, 7, 6. How's that? <coughs> so let's say these are our values for x1. And let's say this is partisan identification or this is income or this is a feeling thermometer for another candidate or something like that. So these are the values, say. Well, we're going to break it up so that every time this value, say 3, is for a man, well, um, actually, here I'm going to have to move these up a little bit because I put them in the wrong spot here. So I will call this X1 and this will be X1 men, X1 females. Okay, and I'll put a 2 here. All right, so every time we have a situation where the value is for a man, see we have a man here, this guy here is called Joe. Joe is a man, see he's got a 1 under the M column. So that means this intercept will work, but this one, which will be a 0 here, 0 times anything goes away, so this intercept simply won't happen, okay, because it'll be a 0 times this beta, and so it's just not going to happen. So he's only going to have the intercept for the men, and his x1 value is going to be a 2. Now what we want here is for that 2 to come over here. Because he's got a value of x1 and he's a man. But this is important. For the value of x1 for women, we want that to be a 0. So just like we separated out 1s and zeros for the intercept term, depending on whether you're a man or a woman, for the male intercept term, you get a 1 if you're a man, a 0 otherwise. For the female intercept term, you get a 0, you get a zero if you're a man, a 1 if you're a woman. Similarly, for the x1 and x1 male and x1 female values, you want the actual original data for x1 if you're a man for x1 for men. But you want 0 otherwise. But now here, this is Susie, the second one. And Susie has a 0 for the male intercept, a 1 for the female intercept. She's got a 3 for her value of x1. So we want to change that for our x1 male value to be a 0. And you want to carry it over to have the 3 for where she is for x1 for the females. So you want the 3 to appear only for the x1 for the females, otherwise a 0. Just like you wanted the 2 for Joe to appear only for the x1 for men, zero otherwise. Now let's call, this is, this is Tom, and this is Betty, and it goes on this way. So now for Tom, he's a man, male one, female zero. His x1 value is four, so we're going to have the four show up under the x1 for men, zero otherwise. Now we have Betty over here, and she's a zero for male, one for female, She's got a 5 for her x1 variable, so we want to make that a 0 for the x1 male value, but carry it over a 5 otherwise. So you see we're splitting up the x1 variable into the actual value or 0, depending on whether they're male or female. So we have two variables instead of one variable, a variable for x1 for x1 men and a variable for x1 women. Now, when this actually gets multiplied through, so you're multiplying these values times the actual slopes and actually when you're doing this you have your 
vector of betas here. So you have your, 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 your various betas that you're multiplying here. This is a whole vector here of, of these things. And when you're multiplying these things uh, as matrix multiplication, this first row comes out, turn it on its side, and multiply here. Okay, then that's how you add it up, and that will be the value for <clears throat> predicted value for Joe. So when this value here gets multiplied, when it gets multiplied by the appropriate beta, this zero will be zero times whatever it is, and it'll go away. But when this value gets multiplied by the appropriate beta, it'll be two times that value, and it will stay. So for Joe, this will work, but this will go away. But when we have, for Betty, I'm sorry, it's Susie who's next. For Susie, when you multiply it out, the zeros will make this go away, but that one will work. Does it make sense? Okay, so we're just separating them out, the variables, based on ones or zeros. And how are we going to do that? Well, look, algebraically, it's really easy. We already have a column of ones and zeros for our men and women. If we simply multiply these intercept variables, male and female, these intercept dummy variables, times our value for x1, hey, if you're going to have a man, the value for x1 will appear, but a woman, it won't. But if, you're for, if you are a woman, the value of x1 will go away. I mean, will, will appear only for the x1 variable, x1 for females variable, but it will go away for men. So by multiplying these things, times the variable of interest, you're actually going to be able to create your x1 for men and x1 for women. Now, we've basically covered enough of how to do this sort of theoretically with regard to the algebra. Let's actually look at how this is done in practice with your R code. So we are starting assignment number five. Now, looking at assignment number five, for this assignment, you will be working with dummy variables to explore conditioning, re conditional relationships using R. As with all assignments, this is an assi assignment in scientific writing and so on. So we want to make sure you explain your results clearly. Be sure to read the assigned article by Gerald Wright. Now, if you click on here, this is one of the best articles in print on the use of dummy variables. Linear Models for Evaluating Conditional Relationships. It's a bit dated, but it's to die for. It's a really good article. Okay? So, in fact, let me just show you. This article here, this will supplement, this is like reserved reading in the library. This will supplement my explanations for, for everything. But um, here's an example where he has, he's using mostly region and so on, but here's an example where you have two sets of data, but we have different intercept dummy variables, but the slopes are the same. So in this case, the slopes wouldn't, different, wouldn't be different and you wouldn't need slope dummy variables. You just need the intercept dummy variables. Okay, so here we have a situation where this is the actual set of data. Now notice that you have the southern states coming up here and most of the northern states coming out here. Now a single regression line that doesn't use the, that does not use dummy variables will just try to make the best it can out of a bad situation. But clearly you should see that the southern state should be having a line here and the northern state should be having a line here. What if you use only intercept dummy variables? Meaning you don't have these extra slope dummy variables working. Well then you're forcing the slope to be the same. So it will give you two different intercepts, but look, clearly the line should be going up. It's got the same, you didn't separate it out with, with, inter, with slope dummy variables, so this line couldn't tilt in a different direction. So they're parallel lines, but with different intercepts. This is a good situation. Here you allow both intercept and slope dummy variables. It's not just two intercepts. 
you get two separate intercepts here, but you also have two separate slopes. So you have essentially two lines going through the data. Does everyone get that? That's good. That's the very best way. Two lines going through the data. All right, so that's essentially what we're doing now. And this is a really, this is the die for this article. So um, let me see, they have, okay, well that's good enough. We have another way to do the test that he's talking about. All right. So you're to use the program below to create and use both intercept and slope dummy variables. Be sure to eliminate the normal intercept, which is the regression through the origin, so that you can uh, avoid a situation of not full rank. The program below creates race intercept dummy variables based on race and slope dummy variables based on race and party ID. The combination of the slope dummy variables is not particularly useful since there are, uh, since very few African Americans are Republican or were in 1980. So the reason I use race uh, and party ID for this example is because it's not a very good use of slope dummy variables because there's hardly any Republican African Americans in this survey. Uh, and I did that so that you would not use those ones and you'd be forced to use a different variable for your slope dummy variables, okay? Thus, you are to create new dummy variables that make sense. If you still want to use race intercept dummy variables, then you should change the slope dummy variables so that they are based on some variable other than party ID. But you could also create intercept dummy variables based on gender or something else entirely that has nothing to do with race, and then the party ID slope dummy variables might be a good idea. You decide what to do. The bottom line is that you need to have intercept dummy variables and then you need to create slope dummy variables that are based on the combination of those two intercept dummy variables and some other variable. Finally, you're to conduct a test to see if the parameter estimates for the intercept dummy variables are equal and another test if the parameter estimates for the slope dummy variables are equal. All of this is done with R. Now, the test is the following. You're going to have two different intercepts here. <laughs> The big question is, was it a good idea to have intercept dummy variables? Remember, a number is never a number in statistics unless you test it. So you need to test to see whether your intercept dummy variable for men is equal to the intercept dummy, is, is, that the intercept for men is equal to the intercept for women. You have to test that. You have to find out if in fact it's true. And you're hoping that, it is, that, they're, not, that they're not equal. You're hoping that they're different because that's the justification for doing the dummy variables in the first place. Similarly, you're going to have to test these two slope dummy variables, these two slope, these two slopes that you get with these two slope dummy variables. And you're going to have to test if beta one for men is equal to beta one for females. You have to test that to see if they're equal. And hopefully they're not equal or if you have a reason for wanting them to be equal in your theory, that's a good thing too. So you're gonna to have to test to see whether these two are equal or whether that one's equal to that one. All right, now for the dependent variable, use only one, meaning I have you doing a lot here with intercept and slope dummy variables, so don't do it for both Reagan and Carter feelings. Just pick one of them and do it to get your head wrapped around the idea of what we're actually doing. So use either feelings for President Jimmy Carter or feelings for challenger Ronald Reagan using the variables Carfield 3 or Carfield or Rayfield 3. All right. Now the data set is the same one we've been using, so we're going to skip over that. And now let's talk about the R code. Okay, here's some R code that will get you started. The rest is up to you. So I'm giving you two ways to create dummy variables with R. The first, may, the first may be more intuitive, and I also have the SAS program below that gives you some additional ideas, but we're using, we're using R, of course. And there's a test in the R code for coefficient equality, which is this thing and that thing. Now I'll explain it a bit, 
but some of you are going to want to have a little bit more meat on those bones. So these three links give different ways to approach it, but it gives you a bit of the theory for the, the use of the test, the test for these two things. But it's a pretty common thing. You have any two things you're trying to test. You have the two numbers and you're trying to test whether they're different. It's pretty much standard based on what we've been doing all throughout. Okay? All right, now let's actually go down and start looking at the actual code. This is the first, easiest, and preferred method for creating the, the actual creation of the dummy variables. First, we actually get our data. This is the same as we've always done. We create our, our my subset data by creating, um, by using the race category, the race variable, for one and two. Now, if we have your subsetting my data, race equals one, or that vertical line on your keyboard, race equals two. And that vertical line on your keyboard should be above the enter key. You have to use your shift. Okay, so you have race equals one or race equals two. There are a few other races in the survey, but there's hardly any people in them, so we just get rid of those, uh, those data, those, those people in the survey. We're just talking about very few numbers. So we're gonna have a race dummy variable for a one and a two. That means Caucasian and African American. Now the method below creates something called a factor, and then converts the factor into a real number by adding a zero to it. Now your, your book on R for dummies has probably the absolute best description that I've ever seen for what factors are. So I really recommend you to read that very short section for factors in R. The only issue here that factors are like categories. We don't want categories. We want numbers. So when you have this Boolean operator right here, so you have my subset data variable race equals one. That creates a factor. It's a category, true or false. Is it one or not? Okay, we don't want that. But if you add something to a factor, one of the things about R is if you add something to a factor, it just assumes that you wanted the number. You don't want it as a factor. So what do we add to it? It's a trick. We add the number zero to it, and it converts it from a factor, which we don't want, to a variable that we do want, which is simply the value for one or two. In this case, we wanted to have the value of one for a white person, okay? So my subset data race, if it equals one, then we're adding a, a zero to it. And that, that zero, of course, doesn't change the value, but it allows us to have a value, a variable here for, that we can call white. And now we do the same thing here for my subset data race, if it equals, if and only if it equals two, I get a factor there for the values only two. This will only be for people that are African American. And we're gonna add a zero to that to convert it back into a number. And we have white and black. And now we want to use the cbind command. Now there's no reason why we had to use the cbind command, except that I wanted to introduce you to, to the, cbind, the cbind command. And what cbind does is it takes two columns and binds them together into one thing. And that one thing we'll call races. So the races is going to equal the binding together of the white and the black. And then we're gonna print it out. Just by typing the word races, it prints out the data. So can everyone do that? Let's highlight that and put that into R. Do that right now. And I will do that too right now. All right, there we go. And all 
Okay, now it's a bit of a long thing because there's a thousand people. There's 918 people left in the survey after we did what we did. Now look what we've got. For our white variable, we have only ones if the person is a Caucasian. Zero otherwise. For our black variable, we have zeros if the person is a Caucasian, but one if they're African American. Do you see that? You see how this categorization does? It says, is it true or is it not true? So it gives it the value of one or zero. And one being true, zero being otherwise. That's what, the, that's what we get when we create this factor. And then over here, we add a zero to it to convert it back into a number. And we have a variable here called white. Again, by binding them together, we just put them into one, one thing called the races, one matrix here. It has a white and a black column, and there it is. So you can see that this first person is a Caucasian. Second person is an African-American. Third person is a Caucasian. The fourth person is an African-American. The fifth person is a Caucasian. And the sixth, seventh, and eighth, all the way down to ninth, they're African-American. And then we have a whole, string of, a whole string of Caucasians. Do you get the idea? Is everyone okay with that? So this thing of creating a factor is very useful. Again, that Arbor Dummies book explains it better than I've ever seen anywhere, that concept of factors. So we want a one or a zero, and that's what we get with this, converted back into a number, and there we have our variable. Now let's see what we do. We're gonna go down to the bottom of this, and let's look at what happens next. Now we wanna create our slope dummy variables. Because we already have our intercept dummy variables, white and black, which are ones and zeros, perfectly arranged. Now we want to create our slope dummy variables. Now again, the slope dummy variable that I'm picking for you this time is not so useful, which is party ID. Because you want to have a variable that has variation, a variable should have variation. You want to have a variable that has variation in both of the categories but there are hardly any African-American Republicans. So this was not a good choice of a variable, and I did it specifically to do this so that you wouldn't be able to use this one. So you have to look for a better one, okay? Now, how do I create my white party ID variable? See that W party ID? It's real simple. I have a dummy variable here called white. Those are my Caucasians. Multiply that times Remember to use your correct data set, the data set with the dollar sign in front of the variable party ID. You, want to use, you don't want to use your my, my data, you want to use your subset data. Okay, they got rid of the extra, extra, the extra races. And so what we have here is the party ID for that data set times white. Now, white is a one or a zero number. So that means whenever white is one, that means it's a Caucasian person, you're gonna multiply it times the party ID variable. And one times anything is as simply the thing itself. So that will be that variable for Caucasians. But whenever it's an African American, this value for white will be zero. And zero times party ID means it'll go away. Are we all right? So you'll have the actual data or zero. <laughs> We're doing the same thing for B party ID, black party ID, and that'll be for African Americans, party ID for African Americans. You take the black variable created here, multiply it times party ID. Every time you have an African American person, it's gonna have a one in it times the party ID variable, so you'll still have the party ID variable. But every time you have a Caucasian person for this black variable, it'll be a zero, and a zero times anything will go away. So you'll only have party ID for African-Americans for this variable, zero otherwise. And for the whites, you'll only have, or Caucasians, you'll only have party ID for the Caucasians, zero otherwise. So you split your party ID variable into zero and whatever the variable is, one for African-Americans, one for Caucasians. Tell me if we're okay with that. You see how easy it was to create that? Once you had your intercept dummy variables, your slope dummy variables were a piece of cake. Now we jump right into the model. 
Carter model, a linear regression model, my subset data, car field three. Remember to use the right data set. Is modeled as, now look, white, black, you're putting in your two intercept dummy variables. Does everybody see that? You see I'm putting in the intercept dummy variable for white, intercept dummy variable for black. And I'm also putting in white party ID and black party ID. I'm putting in the two slopes, the, the two variables for party ID, this one for white people, for Caucasians, and that one's for African Americans. Okay, and in addition, I included the gender, sex variable, and also age. Now the problem is, hey, Courtney, you said you're gonna get R to stop putting in that column of ones. Remember that column of ones that it had for an intercept term over here? That column of ones, it's gonna do it. It's still gonna do it. You haven't done what you said you were gonna do, which is stop it from doing it. Look what I did last. What's the very last thing in this line? Minus one. Does everybody see that? That gets rid of the column of ones. So you see, you're having your car field three modeled as all of these variables minus one. You're subtracting, meaning you're letting R actually put in the column of ones, but then you're subtracting it at the end so it gets rid of the column of ones. And now you have it without it. Now, Different programs do it differently. SAS does it with a special term you have to include in the regression thing called no int, which actually says don't include that intercept term. SPSS does it differently, SATA does it differently, but they all have a ways to do it. R, it's really simple, you just subtract the one. And then this column of ones, which is gonna be put in anyway, gets subtracted and it's gone. Tell me if we're all clear on that. Okay. Now we use a summary thing, and let's do it. So could everybody highlight that right now? This amount, just for up to the summary thing, and for the Carter model, and let's run that right now, okay? Make sure you get it on your computers. Copy that, and let's paste it. All right, so, all right, so let's take a look at what we have here. We have, actually let me make it a little bit bigger here so we can get it all in, good. We have our, a regular, our the statement of our regression we have a, a very mild analysis of residuals, which we're not gonna use here. Now look what we have here. We don't have the word intercept. Remember how you had intercept here before? That's gone, great. But look, you have white and black. This is the intercept for Caucasians and this is the intercept for African-Americans. 63 versus 67. And now we're gonna be interested to know is the 63 different from 67 or are they equal? We want to do a test to see if they're different. But does everyone see we have two intercept terms? All right, now, now look we have, we have two slopes, one for party ID for Caucasians and one for party ID for African Americans. They look pretty different, negative five versus negative point oh, a negative point six three. Again, we're gonna to want to test to see if those things are different, okay? And then we have these other variables thrown in uh, just for good, for uh, just for the sake of putting in something else, uh, the gender and the age variables as well. Now there is one problem, and this occurs both in SAS uh, and, uh, and SPSS and other programs as well. The it's not just it's not just confined to R. When you construct your dummy variables like this, the the R square is not correctly calculated. So the <coughs> R square is like enormous and the R, this is like 0.85, it jumped from like 0.14 up to like 0.85, it's a huge increase. So that's actually not correctly calculated. So uh, this is the same, you'll get the same issue with other programs as well, including SAS, if you do the no int term and, and you have it done without it, they don't correctly calculate the R square. So let's, we're gonna do that ourselves. We're gonna calculate the R square correctly 
But let's go back here and look at what we have here. It's going to be this area right here, which is right underneath our model. Note, R does not calculate, and again, this is not an R problem. This is just, it's based on the way these, the algebra, the linear algebra is done to actually multiply everything through and get the actual numbers. The R square doesn't come out right when you use these dummy variables. So let's actually do it right. The R, the R does not calculate the R squared statistic correctly when suppressing the intercept in the regression model above. That's the problem. The, the actual program for this as well as SAS and others, it's all set up for having that intercept term. And when you suppress that, it actually inserts like an intercept going through zero to the origin. So you really, it, it doesn't calculate the R square correctly. So when suppressing the intercept term. So to do this correctly, the following code is appended. So we're going to actually put this in, and this is actually really good because it shows you the R square, and you're going to calculate it. And it's as simple to be. You just cut and paste it. But let's go through it. We need, we need our SSE, or I call it the RSS, the residual sums of squares. Okay? And that's simply going to be the word residuals is an R thing. That's an R statement. And it's residuals for the Carter model. So the residuals is an actual R statement. It means I want the residuals for this model. And the model is here. Carter model, you call it the Carter model right here. See this Carter model? I want the residuals for that Carter model. So the word residuals says calculate what the residuals are for all those people and in that model and give it to me. And then look what we do. We square it. You see that little carrot there? So you take the residuals for the Carter model, you square it, and you sum it up. Isn't that great? That's just what we did with R square. We get the summed of the squared errors, SSE, or residual sums of squared, same thing. Now, I write it here so you can actually see it. And we're going to do it, and you're going to run it with R, and you'll see. And now I want to get the mean, okay, of the dependent variable, because we're going to need that mean, and you'll see why. The mean is an actual statement in R. You just say mean and write your variable name. It'll give you what the mean is. So I have the mean of car field 3. Okay, and the idea of removing, RM is remove, the NA, which is for those people who are not, who don't, there are people who don't have a car field three variable value. They just said, I don't know, my feelings for Carter beats me. I don't have any feelings for Carter. So they left that blank. So this gets rid of those people. Um, not available, remove, true. Okay, get rid of those people. So for the people who did answer for the car field three variable, what is the mean for those people? And I call this mean dot deep for dependent dot var. I'll remember that. You could have called it Joe or Susie or anything, but if I write mean dependent variable, I'll remember what that is. And then I just type it out here so I can see what it looks like. Now let's get our total sums of squares, that TSS. Those are the only two things we need for the R square, the RSS and the TSS. So the total sums of squares for the dependent variable, it's basically the same type of thing we did before here. We have the total sums of squares is around the mean. It's not around the, re it's not around the predicted value for the Carter model. It's around the mean of the variable. So we have car field 3 minus its mean, the one that we just calculated. Car field 3, remember to use the right data set right before car field 3. So car field 3 minus its mean, parentheses, square it and sum it up. The total sums of squares. The variable minus its mean squared, add it up. Total sums of squares. Now we're ready to get the actual R square. And I wrote it as R dot square. I will remember that, R square. And that's simply 1 minus the residual sums of squares, the RSS thing that we calculated here, divided by the TSS. And then I print it out, and we've got it. And that's, that's calculated correctly. So let's actually 
find out what the actual R square is. So this is really good because when you present your results, actually you'll see some people presenting results for dummy variables and you'll see a whole, I've actually seen lots of presentations <laughs> where they actually in public presented their dummy variable results and they had the R square that actually came out from SPSS or SAS, just the one that was there and it's like the wrong number. <laughs> It's like very embarrassing. And you're sort of sitting in the audience and you're wondering whether you should actually tell them right in the middle of the presentation that their R square is like humongously wrong because then everybody's gonna wonder about everything else. Sometimes you do it politely and you wait till after the presentation's over. Sometimes you say, might as well just ask them and tell them it was not done right. Because watch what happens. Remember that big R square? Well, let's calculate this correctly, everybody. Let's highlight all of that stuff from the residual sums of squares down to the R square value. Do that right now on your computer. Copy it. Now look at what the R square was. Everyone see what the R square that R actually calculated was? It was 0.8529. What was the real value of R square that it should have actually printed? 0.21, <laughs> it's a big difference. <laughs> so you can see how embarrassing it is when somebody gives a presentation and they have this huge R square and they're beaming and a big smile from ear to ear and you're looking at them and you say, when do I tell them the news? <laughs> the R square was actually 0.21. It's actually not a bad R square. The dummy variables actually do increase the R square nicely because you're allowing the fit line, the, the predicted line to go in two different directions. That's really great. The R square is gonna go up, but it doesn't go up to 0.85. It's a 0.218. That's what the actual R square is. All right, does everyone get it? Are we okay? So, it's not a bad thing. Puts a little sophistication in your work. So when you use dummy variables, slope and intercept dummy variables, you actually have the code for correctly calculating the R square. Why is this going to be valuable to you? You're going to go to graduate school. A lot of your professors are not going to know how to calculate the, or the, they'll not know that the R square coming out of the program is incorrectly calculated and you're doing it for them. Remember this type of stuff. You'll actually, it'll benefit you later, not just in your own work, but other professors will value your ability to sort of sort all this out. So this is, an, the reason I'm making such a big deal of it is it's, a, it's an underexplained phenomenon of using dummy variables with the available software. And it's not just R, it's also SAS, SPSS, and others. So a lot of people don't understand that that actually happens, but you do. All right, now, Let's go here, which tests for the equality of the, of the two means. The one way to test for the equality of the two regression parameters is with an F-test using the so-called walled procedure. Now it's done here. Let's actually do this. Now this one is a little bit more involved than the simple of the R-square. Calculating, now I want to say something here. This is the one advantage, pretty much the only advantage in the whole course for using SAS as compared with R. I'm going to show you what we do to calculate the test for these two variables. But first, I'm going to show you how we do it in SAS. Now I'm not going to explain all the SAS code, I'm just going to show you what SAS does to calculate the test between these, and this is what we're going to have to, we're going to have to redo. Let's go down here to the code in SAS. Now I'm not going to explain the whole thing in SAS. I'm just going to say PROC REG in SAS is the procedure for regression. That's the same as the LM procedure for R. Here's the model. That's the same as the model procedure that we, as when we, you know, is modeled as. That's the same as that in R. Here's the two tests. Test white equals black, done. Test uh, white party ID equals black party ID, done. Prints the nice test and you're done. <laughs> that is easy, okay? So we're going to redo that, but R doesn't have a built-in way to do that like SAS does. So, but it's still easy to do, but it's not as easy as SAS, okay? Now, wait a few months, somebody will write it into R and it'll be okay. <laughs> but until that happens, we have to do it manually. 
All right, so let's do that. Okay, let's do the actual walled procedure. Now, there's actually two ways that you can do it. First way is a walled procedure, and the second way is the confidence interval. You're going to build a confidence interval around it, and that will work just fine as well. And in fact, I have, for the confidence interval approach, which is basically the same thing as the, the confidence interval approach versus the walled procedure, it's a standard old thing that we've always been dealing with. Do you use a test or you use a confidence interval? They, all, they both do the same thing. For those people who like the confidence interval approach, there's a really nicely explained description of this uh, by, by uh, Eric Hanischek and John Jackson in their book that's a classic in statistics and is well respected everywhere called Statistical Methods for Social Scientists and it's on page 124. So if you actually do this, you're likely going to run into professors that you work for that may not know about this procedure, not understand how you're doing the tests. So it's going to be very useful for you to go back and say, look, it's in this book. They'll recognize the book and they'll say, oh, okay, I, you know what you're doing. So this is actually a very useful place to go back and have this confidence interval approach explained. But first, let's go back and do it with the walled procedure. Now, for both of them, for the confidence interval approach as well as for the walled procedure, you're going to need the coefficient covariance matrix. That's that thing we've been dealing with all along. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to be using the v cove statement for that model. Okay? And this will give you the coefficient covariance matrix just for the variables that are in that model. All right? Now, now we're going to print that out. So let's do that. We're going to do this step at a time. Let's calculate just the coefficient covariance matrix. There we go. Okay, now these are not standardized variables, remember. So you're not going to have that diagonal row of ones. This is just the coefficient covariance matrix. And, all right, so we have, it went a little bit too wide. Let me see, I wonder if I can make this thing wider. Will it actually print out wider or does it continue? What if I, let me see if I can, if I paste it again, what will happen? Yeah. There we go. I got to print it out all in one swoop there going from left to right. So this is our coefficient covariance matrix, okay? And you can do a question mark VCOV. It's specially designed to work with these regression models, okay? For just the coefficients that we're dealing with. So there we have that. We're gonna need that when we use the walled procedure. So now let's go back to the walled procedure and go through what we're actually doing. This is the walled procedure. Unfortunately, you're going to need a piece of paper and a pen. <laughs> this is the one time you actually have to go back to rudimentary technology in the days before computers. You're going to need a paper and a pencil to finish the equality tests since the LM procedure in R does not do this for you automatically. From the coefficient covariance matrix, which we call V, take the variance of each variable, which is in the matrix, it's all printed out for you, and the covariance for the two variables together, plus the original parameter estimates from the regression, and calculate your F statistic using this formula. Now this exact thing we're going to do is exactly what SAS does if you just go test and have those two variables equal, it'll produce an F test. So this is that F test. So the things you're going to actually need is you're going to need the variance for each variable, you're going to need the covariance for the two variables together, plus the original parameter estimates from the regression. And then you calculate that. Now, I actually do it for you here, so let's hold off just a little bit. This is the one where I actually do it, but this is the one where I actually explain it. So let's go through the one I explained first. 
you take your parameter 1. That's the first number that you got. Let's say we're doing it for the intercepts. That's this guy. Okay? And you subtract this parameter 2, which is this guy, which is a standard test procedure. We're trying to find out if, in fact, they're different. So we subtract the 2, and we, we really want to know, is the difference different from 0? Okay? If this is equal to 0, then they're the same. If they're not equal to 0, they're different if you subtract the 2. So we're subtracting parameter 1 from parameter 2. And how do you do that? You divide it by its standard error, the joint standard error for the two things, right? Any test is the same. You take the number you want, divide it by a standard error, and you look at 1.96. Is it bigger or smaller? So what we're dealing is we subtract parameter 1 from parameter 2. Now the standard error is actually gotten from this thing. You take the square root of, remember we're getting the standard error, so you're going to have to take the square root. It's not the variance, it's the square root. Standard error. The square root of the variance of the first parameter plus the variance of the second parameter minus two times the covariance of both parameters. <coughs> now, that means the variance is in the matrix that we just printed out for both parameters. The covariance for both parameters is there also. We need to stick those in here. And that is here, we're going to call P1 is parameter 1, and P2 is our parameter 2. So you're going to have to have the variance P1, variance P2, and everything else. So what we're actually going to do is have P1 and P2 come from your regression. The var P1 and var P2, uh, and the covariance P1, P2, come from your coefficient covariance matrix. And you also get the, vari the var p1 and the var p2 by squaring the standard errors for p1 and p2. So that's another way you can get the, the, uh, these things, the variance of p1 and variance of p2. You can either get them from the coefficient covariance matrix right above, or you can go back to the original standard errors for p1 and p2 from your regression and simply square them. That's the other way to do it. Okay. Note that the big difference between the F statistic and the T statistic is, if, is with the F you are squaring everything, including the difference between the two parameter values. Actually, that's the relationship between a T statistic and an F statistic. You'll get that better explained in your next course in statistics, but an F statistic is simply the square of a T statistic, and that's sort of shown here. Okay, now we're actually going to get the F statistic and use it from R. So let's actually do that. So uh, in R, what you're going to actually have to do is take your P1, you're actually going to have to assign things for these things right here. So what I'm going to do for you is the following. And I want everybody to do this with me. <laughs> okay? We're going to write down the various things. We need P1, P2. Okay, we're going to actually do it together. Okay? I want you to type it in as I write it. I'm going to write it on the board first, then you're all going to type it in. Then we're going to need the, the variance of P1 and the variance P2. And I'm running a bit out of space here, so let me grab that. And I need the covariance. Covariance P1, P2. So to make there be no ambiguity for how this is done, let us all do it together. Okay, because this is a little bit involved, so I want to make sure we do it. So let's get our first parameters, P1 and P2. Let's go back to R. Now let's do it for the intercept terms. It's pretty simple, okay? So we have a 63 and a 67. Let's go two decimal points. 63 point 83. For African Americans, it's 67.1, and I round it up, 1.5. Okay, so those are the two parameters that I need. Well, let's get the variance. Now we can do the variance two ways. The variance for P1, I could either take this and square it, but then I've got to square it. I've got to get a calculator or use R to square it. Or I could have taken this 6 and squared it. 
But it's easier just to simply go to the coefficient covariance matrix and get it here. Okay, so your variance is going to be 17.54. Uh, 17.54. Everyone see that? And let's get this 46 point, actually let's round it up, that'll be 46.6. 46.6. Does everyone see where this is coming from? This is the, the variance for white, the variance for black, 46.6. Now let's get the covariance. The covariance will be, um, uh, let's, let's take it from right here, okay? So we can take it from this 13 or that 13 because it's the same thing because there's some, you know, the, it's everything above the diagonal is the same as below the diagonal. But I'll take it from here, the covariance between white and black will be the 13.51. Are we all right with that? Now, everybody, could you just do this for me? I want you to make sure you all know it. We have a few minutes. Can you type these all in, in the bottom of your R code? Literally, you can do it in R Studio. And in fact, what I'm going to do, the crude kludgy way, I'm going to do it in WordPad. How's that? How's that for being a dinosaur, okay? P1, and I'll put little spaces in here just to make it look neat. 63.83. Next line, P2. Now remember to have your capitals because the next line, you're, the, the, the actual calculation thing, I have it all capitals. I think I have it capitals. I think these are small letters. Remember to have your capitalization as small as correct. Okay, so we have 67.15, and then VAR, which is not capitalized, but P is capitalized. Put a space there, 17.54, next one, VAR, P2, Forty-six point six, and then the covariance for P capital P capital P again for P one P two. I'll put a space there and make it neat, and I'll have thirteen point five one. And people should check me. I can type and make mistakes just as easily as an exponent. I forgot. See the variance. I made a mistake. I forgot to put the less than and the dash sign after that. Let's check me again. Yeah, it looks sort of okay for government work. What do you think? Everybody else have it? All right. Now let's just copy these things in to R. Actually, let's do the following. Let's calculate, let's copy the next line as well so that we don't have to do it separately. The next line is the actual, there we go. This is the actual formula which gives us our F test. This is the actual F statistics. And notice that all of these things are things that we just typed in up here. So they're gonna flow right into those spots. Bang, it'll work. So the reason for using a back of an envelope or piece of paper is because you need to go from here to here and that's not automatically done for you with R. It's these lines that you have to write. If you write them this way, this line will be automatic because it's a cut and paste. But these ones you actually have to write out you, because you have to actually put these numbers in those spots in order to figure it out. So let's calculate what it is now. What is that F statistic? And put that into R. There we go, everybody. And now let's calculate, now let's just print it out. I didn't, 
unfortunately, I didn't type the letter F here, so it didn't, it calculated what it was, but it didn't print it, so I just typed out the letter F. That's our F statistic. 0.2969. Okay. Now, let's go back here. The last, as Johnny Bravo would say, this is the Coupe de Gracie moment. That's, we now have our F statistic. And all we have to do is to uh, put in for the F statistic the degrees of freedom and put in the F statistic and we're ready to go. Now, if you have the F statistic, you need the degrees of freedom and there are two types. The F statistic is different from the T statistic. The F statistic is based on a ratio actually, so it has, a, has two types of degrees of freedom. And so we're going to call them degrees of freedom 1 and degrees of freedom 2. The T statistic only had one degree of freedom, but F has two. Here, degrees of freedom 1 uh, is just the number 1, and it's the number of tests involved, and there's just one test involved. Degrees of freedom 2 is n minus k, where n is the number of observations in the regression. And k is the number of slope and intercept parameters that you're estimating in the model. Okay, so let's actually do this. Let's actually, we have the F test here. We're going to actually, there's, there's two ways we can do it. Don't go away yet. We're, we've got another minute. The, let me go back to F, this here. DF1. Oops, I did something here. Hold on. DF1. DF1 in this case is the number one. So I'm just going to put that in. One, enter. And then DF2. Equals. N minus K. N is the number of observations in the regression, and K is the number of slope and intercept parameters that you're estimating in the model. And you get that. That's the standard degrees of freedom that we've already got printed out here. So let's just go back to the Carter model and find out what our degrees of freedom was. And we've got 700 degrees of freedom here. So let's put in a 700 for that thing. And then we put 700 here, okay? And then we also have to have our F. And so why don't we just go F, F equals, and let's just copy and paste that from the actual R, which was 0 0.029, okay? And I'll put that in WordPad also. Okay, so now what we need is the last thing, which is the actual statement here, which is the F statistic. And this will give you the prob value stuff that you actually need. So I'm copying and pasting this thing, which gives you your F statistics, and you just do that. And I'm going to put it here. I'm going to put it here in WordPad. And now I'm just going to copy and paste those spots I'm hoping everybody's doing this with their own. I'm going to put it right here now. And there we go. Okay? So, in this case, it didn't work out so good. Those numbers were not very different from each other, given the variation that occurred. So you have your F statistics, your F statistic, which, is, uh, which we got before, giving uh, you know, prob values that aren't very useful for that. So anyway, this, um, this didn't turn out to be a very good breakdown for that, but, but uh, you can see how the process is done. Now, what I'm going to do is the following. For Thursday, you're not going to do this assignment till over the weekend. So for Thursday, could everybody try to come up with some dummy variables in a regression that's not party ID? And you can use gender. You don't have to use race. Race didn't work out very well here. So why don't you try something else? Try gender or something. But I want you to actually try it. You're going to have to 
do it over the weekend and hand it in on Tuesday. So just tonight and tomorrow, with your computer, create some dummy variables and do the wall test. I will then explain the confidence interval approach, which is very simple. It's actually simpler than the wall test. It's very simple, in fact. I will explain the confidence interval approach to you on Thursday, but we're going to start out with you telling me, don't wait until the weekend to have it your first attempt to produce these dummy variables. Just try it. It's only going to take you 15 minutes to try it, pick out some dummy variables, create them, run the regression, see if you can do the wall test, see if it all works. Come in on Thursday, I'll fix whatever's wrong, whatever's got a problem, and I'll explain also the confidence interval approach. And then you'll be ready to do the assignment over the weekend. All right? <laughs> See you then.